I now have the very great honor of introducing our first speaker, Dr. Benoit Mandelbrot, the founder of Fractal Geometry. Dr. Mandelbrot earned degrees in engineering and science from Ecole Polytechnic and the California Institute of Technology, and a doctorate in mathematics from the Faculté des Sciences de Paris. He worked at the National Center for Scientific Research in Paris until 1957. In 1958, he moved to the United States and joined the research staff at IBM. Since 1974, he has been an IBM fellow based at the Thomas J. Watson Research Center, and since 1987, the Abraham Robinson Adjunct Professor of Mathematical Sciences at Yale University. During his career, he has held a wide variety of visiting positions, including those of visiting professor of economics and research fellow in psychology at Harvard University, lecturer in electrical engineering at MIT, and visiting professor in physiology at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. He is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and of numerous scientific societies and an associate of the National Academy of Sciences. He has won many honors, awards, and medals, including the prestigious Chevalier, the Order of the Legion of Honor in France. A true polymath, he is the author of over 100 articles in professional journals, ranging over a broad spectrum of disciplines, including communication and information theory, the structure of language, thermodynamics, probability, economics, turbulence and fluids, hydrology, geology, cosmology, and art. He has written that, quote, it had seemed to many that each of my investigations was aimed in a different direction. But this apparent disorder was misleading. It hid a strong unity of purpose. Against odds, most of my works turn out to have been the birth pangs of a new scientific discipline." Close quote. In 1975, he laid many of the foundation stones of the new science of fractal geometry in his essay in French, uh, Fractals, Form, Chance, and Dimension. Then in 1982, he published The Fractal Geometry of Nature, his marvelous manifesto and casebook of the new science. He is currently working on new books on multifractals. Ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted to present the father of fractal geometry, Professor Benoit Mandelbrot, to speak on the fractal geometry of nature and chaos. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here and very much honored by being asked to speak first at this meeting. Uh, in a certain sense, uh, the topic of my lecture will be followed by that of Heinz Otto Peigen, who will close the meeting, uh, which puts me in a very awkward position of uh, uh, trying to tell you about fractals without knowing what uh, Heinz Otto is going to tell you at the, at the end. But um, let's uh, have been old friends and I'm sure that everything is going to be fine. Now, the way I try to organize my lecture is the following. First of all, I would like to introduce you to a large number of fractals. Uh, fractals are geometric shapes, and to understand geometric shapes, one must see them. It's something very fundamental, very often forgotten, and forgotten at uh, very great loss, that uh, geometry must have a visual component. And so um, I was hoping to show you a large number of slides. The best way to do so is going to be to play for you a small part of a program which uh, some friends of mine and myself have organized last April at the Guggenheim Museum. That will come after a brief introduction. So most of the talk will be in terms of projection slides and so on. I'm very worried about the people sitting here and here because they are going to see nothing. <laughs> so if you can move closer, you'll probably be better off. But that is just a matter of advice. Now, <laughs> uh, 
Uh, well, so let me begin by at the beginning. May I have the first slide? Oh, I see. Can you see me a little bit less? Yes, thank you. <laughs> well, I begin by this quote from Galileo, which is uh, something quite marvelous. At the dawn of um, science, Galileo Galilei described the great book of nature as being written in geometric language. And that this language, he says, is made of characters, which are circles, cones, etc., without which one errs in vain a dark labyrinth. Without knowing these characters, science is impossible. On the basis of these characters, Galileo built um, the beginnings of mechanics and therefore of science. These characters were borrowed from Greek geometry. And Greek geometry uh, had uh, an interesting episode in its development. Um, if you um, read, as I did once on somebody's advice, The Life of Marcellus by Plutarch, you find a passage in which uh, the following story described. The two men named Archytas and Eudoxus had applied the geometry to the science of mechanics and showed that you could, with understanding of shape, understand the, the, um, the laws of nature, and at the same time that you could use the illustration of geometry presented by mechanics as a help in understanding geometry. Plato was indignant at this, uh, at this situation. He said that was a shame, a disgrace, a pure science of geometry should be put to the base usage as to um, use mechanics, some vile usage, and that a proper geometer is a person who does not need the concrete illustrations of mechanics to do his job. Well, so you see that there had been a tension for a very long time mathematics between those who believe in purity, in absence of uh, imp imp input from the eye and from science, and those who believe the contrary. Well, clearly, uh, um, Galileo believed the contrary. Now, what is the geometry he was referring to? Uh, here is one example of the geometry. It happens to be the IBM Research Center, which I show here not at all because it's a marvelous building to live in, because it's not. <laughs> it's a typical, <laughs> typical modern building, but uh, it exemplifies uh, one essential role of geometry in our everyday life. Uh, Euclidean geometry is a geometry of shapes we see around, uh, around us, which are made by man. Man's works are very uh, typically flat, round, in general follow the same very simple shapes of classical school geometry. Now we all know by experience that the world around us, the questions which are primary in the sense of being the first to be asked, are, could not be answered by this geometry. For example, mountains are too complicated for that. And let us look at this mountain. It is not at all a real photograph. The previous one was. This is not. It's completely mathematical forgery, computer forgery, mathematical formula. Mountains are more complicated than any shape in Euclidean geometry. Clouds are more complicated than any shape in Euclidean geometry. Therefore, to describe the nature around us, we have to do something else. We have to go beyond Euclid. How far can we go? Well, if you go too far, you get lost in excess of generality. The bane of, uh, two banes of science are lack of generality and excess of generality. There's a certain level of proper generality which is necessary in order to do things right. And um, the, um, the geometry uh, which uh, is able to, to include these shapes uh, does exist now. It was uh, put together uh, by me primarily in, in initial stages 15 years ago out of very many pieces which have been around for a very long time. Like everything in science, this has very, very deep and long roots, but there have been a turning of roles. Um, objects which were viewed as being very, very far from physics turned out to be the proper tools for studying physics. So that is the aspect of my talk, which is the, going to be geometry of nature and I will describe some more specific examples after this little show. Now about chaos. It's a topic which other speakers are going to describe, but I would like to mention immediately that the proper geometry of chaos is the same as the proper geometry of the mountains and the clouds. It is something quite marvelous, because it might have happened, perhaps, that different geometries would have been needed to follow that of Euclid, but it's not so. Fractal geometry is has two roles, one to describe again the shape of mountains and clouds. Mountains, as I wrote, once, once are not cones, clouds are not spheres. 
Islands are not circles. Rivers don't flow straight. This ge same geometry is the proper geometry of everything which is geometric in the state of chaos, which you will hear mostly from the other speakers. And I would like to show you a few examples of the shapes in which I encounter in this context. This is a very, very magnified version of a set which, to which my name had me attached. Um, uh, the, it's magnified in ratio of Avogadro's number. Why that? Well, because it's a nice number. 10 to 23. <laughs> because, <laughs> as it turned out, this number was, was a good opportunity for testing the quadruple precision arithmetic on IBM computers. It's very amusing to be able to justify fun and science on the basis of such uh, specific uh, growth. Uh, if the whole Mandelbrot set had been drawn on the same scale, the end of it would be some, somewhere around Sirius. It's enormous magnification. Now, you will see later um, something about that, and, and uh, Heinz Soto, I'm sure, is going to talk about it a great deal. Now, this shape here is a variant of the same set, corresponding to a slightly different formula. I will not repeat the formula. I would like to show this, this, this um, shape simply to comment on something which is one totally amazing and uh, extraordinarily satisfying aspect of fractal geometry. It is that shapes which are initially developed for the purpose of science, for the purpose of understanding how the world is put together, both statically and dynamically, statically in terms of mountains, dynamically in terms of chaos, strange attractors, etc. The same shapes are perceived by many people as being beautiful. This shape here was not intended to be beautiful. It was just an exercise for going through to try to find something else which we could study with reasonable facility to justify investing time in it. And it turned out to have many features which surprise us to this day. For example, it seems to be three-dimensional. In fact, it's not. It's completely flat. But to my eye, there is like a piece of leather which comes up and goes down, casts a black shadow to the left, and uh, the edge of it also casts a shadow. I'll mention that uh, simply uh, as a, a kind of a, a question. Why are these shapes beautiful? What do they tell us about our system of perception? Because uh, experience has shown us that the same features are seen in them by many different people in some cases. In other cases, different people read different things in, the same sh in these shapes. The shapes don't mean what people read into them. Therefore, there is a very a great deal of uh, understanding of this matter, which I think we are going to uh, comment briefly uh, towards the end. Well, uh, we sh you also see shapes of this form like, uh, like this, which is called the Snowflake Curve, or the Koch Island, has many names, was um, discovered by a man named Helge von Koch, a professor of mathematics in Stockholm in 1905. And uh, uh, these shapes play a very important role in fractal geometry because they're easy to study. They're easy to study, but in a certain sense, they're very finite. You must begin with them, but that is not where the fun begins. The fun begins beyond them. And so, um, uh, how to present the fun? I would like to uh, play a small excerpt from this uh, video. Let me explain the, how it started. Charles Warren is a very famous composer in New York, uh, very highly, um, very well known, Pulitzer Prize winner, etc., etc. He called me many years ago and uh, suggested we meet, and we had a very good time talking about music, about fractals. He has a very, very good understanding of science, which very much surprised me and impressed me. Then uh, last uh, summer, last winter, we discussed the possibility of doing something together. What came out was that um, Charles' piece, New York Notes, which you see here described, was played at uh, the auditorium of the uh, Guggenheim Museum in New York on the right side of the stage. On the left side of the stage, we, that is uh, Richard Voss and others whose names will appear in the credits, uh, prepared together a, a collection of slides. Now, so I'm going to start about the middle of this, uh, of this piece, and it is not the whole piece, but you'll, and please take it uh, in two roles. One, which is just a collection of, of slides shown very, very quickly after each other and merging into each other better than I can do with this carousel, and at the same time as a preliminary to a short discussion of fractals and music, which I will have after it comes through. So may I have now the, the video? You may have this light down, please, because it will help the video if this light is there.
Could you please cut the tape now? Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt in the middle, but uh, we must uh, go on. I will explain to you later um, about uh, s some things about it. But uh, now let me um, begin by repeating again. The music is by Charles Warren. Uh, the musicians um, who played in are, um, well, uh, you many, many of you must know some of these names. Fred Sherry is the very famous cellist and director of New York um, in the Lincoln Center, chamber music players, and this piece is going to be played there again next March on 8th, 9th, and 10th of March. It has become something of a fixture in New York musical scene. But um, I have no time to continue for, uh, for it. I will explain in a few minutes how this uh, union of music and fractals came up. But um, let me um, now uh, come to business. You have seen many, many shapes, all of them computer generated. Each of them had uh, the following characteristic. It had a very simple formula, formula reduced to its essential stakes, one line, two lines perhaps. But out of this formula comes this extraordinary wealth of structure that you have observed. This wealth of structure was taken up by very fine computer people whose names I'm going to mention momentarily when I show the slides again, and who rendered it. The effects of light of, and so on are uh, state of the art in computer graphics, but are not part of the main point. The main point again is the coexistence of very great simplicity of formula and very great complexity of shape. And so here we are in the middle of this uh, problem, this kind of quandary which science had faced for so long that the geometry was extraordinarily effective, extraordinarily powerful as a tool in the sciences, by geometry I mean Euclid, yet everything around the experience was different from Euclid. If we want to go beyond Euclid and create new shapes which are able to comprehend the complication of nature, we must in a way go by small steps. And one of the central tools of science is the idea of invariance. The idea that somehow things are complicated, but not infinitely complicated. They're complicated, but, but orderly. In the case of uh, fractal geometry, the great invariance is self-similarity, self-affinity, self-alikeness, self-symmetry in this sense. One has a, a complicated reality, which has in it a great deal of structure. The structure being due to the fact that each part is in some sense the same thing as a whole but smaller. Now, anybody who has been attuned to, uh, to art for over the centuries realizes that this idea had been very common in the arts. The idea that, uh, well, in Indian paintings, very often there are small Buddhas on the robe of a big Buddha, and yet smaller Buddhas on the robes of the smaller Buddhas, and so on, as far as if a painter's br brush could do it. In, uh, again, in uh, Buddhist um, writings, there are stories of big palaces, which are such that uh, each room of this palace is like the whole world, and in it there is a small part which is like the palace itself, and that small part is a room which is like the room in which the speaker or the man who tells the story sits. And uh, coming back to Western civilization, certainly in Aristotle, there are many such echoes. In Leibniz, they are very, very strong. Leibniz had the idea that in each drop of dew, a whole world resided. If you look carefully in the spring of a leaf on a drop of dew, you will see a sun with its planets, the planets with their, their beings, their leaves, and their drops of dew, etc., etc., at infinity. Therefore, this idea of repetition, the idea that the parts are like the whole, is one which is very much a fabric of our thinking as humans for a very long time. The only trouble with it, and a very major trouble, is that it was scientifically a poor idea. That is, it was applied in contexts where it doesn't hold. It is not the case that an atom is like a sun with planets, only in a very, very crude way, otherwise very, very different. Therefore, much of the thrust of science over many years has consisted in fighting this, how to say, natural sliding into the notion of self-similarity, self-alikeness, which humans are very prone to entertain. Well, fractal geometry is based upon the, upon the notion that in, there are some fields of endeavor in which the sliding down is not necessary. And so the basic invariance of 
fractals is the one I described. I'm going to give you some examples of it momentarily. Now, which is the simplest example of it? This is one. Um, it is due to a man named Shapinsky. I call the Shapinsky gasket as uh, something of a joke, and the joke has stuck. It's very obvious by looking at it, it's made of four parts, or three parts, blue, yellow, and red, each of which is exactly like the hole, except it's twice smaller. Well, Shapinsky defined, defined this uh, shape for some purpose, uh, which has been forgotten, rightly, because it was not very important. But um, the, the main uh, fact about it is, it is so simple that in a certain sense it is almost like Euclid. If you come to think f about it for a few days, you know about everything there is to be said about it. It's a shape which is rather poor. The formula, which consists in taking the middle part of this uh, triangle and so on and so on at infinitum, is elementary, and uh, there is not much you really find by studying deeply. So the impression may prevail that if you take self-similarity, it's a barren and not a fruitful uh, idea. But to show that it's not so, this is uh, the same thing in three dimensions, to show that so, let us uh, go a little bit further. First of all, we go to some plants. Some plants, in fact, have a surprisingly large degree of self-similarity. This branch here is completely artificial, computer-generated, but each branch is exactly like the whole, except it's smaller. Well, very many of our plants are very nearly self-similar. And they should be, because they consist in branching, branching, branching. Each stage of branching is ruled by the same uh, rules, therefore the same things happen, but the bigger the plant, the bigger the thing that happen. That's the kind of very rough idea what makes self-similarity arise here. It must be so. Uh, one often fears that self-similarity in this fashion would hold only for a few levels, that if you go in greater detail, the branches stop branching, they end up, they have an end. It's true. Like, uh, like very often in science, you have a principle, which is a simplifying principle of understanding. It does not apply if you go too far in the very small or too far in the very large. Sometimes it does, sometimes it does not. Very often it does not. Now, let's look at this shape here, which is a real one, the second photograph of a real object. Uh, you may recognize a species, a variety of um, cauliflower called Romanesco which is characterized by an extraordinary level of self-similarity. If you look at each of the knobs of it, they look absolutely like the whole, uh, and then they carry themselves knobs and so on. Well, the first uh, reaction of scientists looking on such um, shapes was to focus on all the spirals which exist in it. And uh, there, there's quite a, a lot of knowledge in botany about the way plants spiral. Fibonacci sequences play a role in that, which is very interesting. But what is more important for, for us here is the fact that each part of it, over five levels of separation, which you can see, and then many more levels you cannot see, but only except magnifying glass or microscope, you find the same structure repeated again and again. Therefore, this, this notion that somehow self-similarity would be a, a dead thing is not true even in this case. But the most important things go further. The most important thing go when we add an element of unpredictability or an element of nonlinearity. Actually, nonlinearity, which is chaos, and unpredictability, which is chaos in different, in the older sense of the word, are very intimately linked. I will say a few words about that if I think of it. But um, uh, that is what I'm going to come to in a minute. But before that, I would like to, uh, to say a few words about music. Uh, the reason why Charles Warren came to see me um, is the following. He said that for many, many years he had been worrying in his own mind about difference that exists between noise and music. Clearly, he would say, listening to something, this is music. It's very bad music. Very bad, but it's music. And listening to this thing, he would say that is noise, a pleasant noise, but it's noise. Now, what, does it, what makes a difference in my mind that he, he told me uh, between these two. And uh, he was quite uh, incapable of formulating his ideas on this subject. Then he looked, uh, he saw my book and uh, saw the key to it. Now there's one part of this, uh, of the idea of fractal geometry as language, which I have not yet emphasized enough. Fractal geometry is a language, a geometric language, which can be used to understand, to organize our experience and to go further, to explain our experiences. For Charles, this was a matter of organizing. 
he always felt that a long piece of music must be in a way composed. That is, if you have 30 minutes of music, you have a fast, a slow, and a fast movement. Each movement it will have a loud, a soft, and a loud part. Each part will have a clarinet solo, a violin solo, some other solo, and, it, and so on. There must be change variety at all scales. And that characteristic, he told me, was to him the, the principal criterion that distinguished music as an organized activity from noise which is organized differently or is not organized at all. And uh, therefore, he asked me whether he had, had any kind of inkling of that. Sure enough, I had very strong inkling because my friend Richard Voss, who is the author of many of these pictures, I'm going to identify him to, for you very shortly, which pictures he did, uh, who is actually a, a Minnesota boy from St. Paul, not far from here, but who left this uh, um, uh, state for other places on the east or west coast. Uh, Dick Voss had, in his PhD thesis at, uh, in Berkeley, been playing with one over F noise. What is one over F noise? Well, it's a noise, a fluctuation, which is between a hum and the brown motion. I'm going to come to it momentarily in the next slide. It's a form of fluctuation which is very, very common in physics and very little understood, in many ways, a very great mystery. So Richard Voss was trying to understand one of F noise, and he uh, was analyzing all kinds of things around him to see whether perhaps they were or were not one of F noises. He found that music, um, the, the notes, the loudness, all kinds of characteristics of music, characteristics of music are scales longer than a sound. That is, it's not a matter of analyzing the sound of a cello or a sound of a clarinet, but the musical part of it. All these characteristics, if properly analyzed, gave one of ref noises. What does it mean? It means precisely what Warren was telling from the musician's viewpoint. That is, uh, organized music in Western culture had this, this very strong structure. It was through Bach, of Beethoven, of the Beatles. Because the Beatles are just as academic in terms of the writing as Bach or Beethoven. They follow the same rules. He went to analyze uh, some uh, records from a store selling ethnic music from Africa. The same thing was true, one over F. He went on to analyze Boulez and Stockhausen, and they are not one over F. Now, a very general feeling that Boulez and Stockhausen were different from Bach, Beethoven, and Beatles was confirmed in sort of objective fashion. Now, whether you think that it is stronger than what everybody believed before is not a matter. Sometime later, I met another musician who was um, uh, Ligeti, uh, George Ligeti, and he told me exactly the same story as, as uh, Warinen. In fact, he went on saying that all musicians have this feeling that some things are music, others are not, and in Ligeti's opinion, the feeling is based upon whether the, there is an element of self-invariance, self-symmetry, self-affinity, to be more specific, in that structure, when there is is perceived as being music, good or bad, when it is not, is perceived as not being music at all. Well, um, uh, in the music which you heard um, in that short video, uh, a part was computer generated. Uh, given the skill of uh, Warinen, it was not obtrusive, it was not um, something which stopped the action and said, here I am, I'm a computer generated piece. But there was eight musicians, the seven, one, the seven whose names were shown on the credit line, and an eighth, which was a computer-generated part. It was amazing, speaking with the audience after the performance, to realize that most people did not feel that a new instrument has come in. And that new instrument was noise, generated according to very simple rules, in which it was made sure that self-similarity was maintained. Even at this very, le very crude level, Warren felt that this added an element to his music. Well, let me continue faster um, uh, with what fractals are and introduce the notion of fractal dimension, which is very fundamental in this context. Now, first of all, self-similarity. Um, uh, you see on top an element, a segment is divided into pieces. Uh, if you divide into five pieces, each piece is one-fifth of the whole thing. Then you see a square. A cube um, is divided into pieces, and the square is divided into four pieces. Each of them is smaller than the ratio of two. 
Therefore, this uh, ratio, which is written in bold letters in the bottom, d equal logarithm of n divided by logarithm over n uh, over r, which is log of number of pieces divided by log of the reduction ratio, this uh, ratio is uh, something which characterizes, which is identical in these cases to ordinary dimension. It is one on top; it's two for in the plane, three in space. Well, starting from this very broad intuitive idea, which is called similarity dimension. Uh, mathematicians have developed a large number of notions of dimension. One of them is called the hausdorff bezikovich because people who created it, others another called the minkowski bouligan etc., etc. There are ways of implementing this idea of dimension in such a fashion that instead of representing what we ordinarily know as dimension, which is a point dimension zero and the line dimension one and the plane dimension two, etc., you can interpolate and have shapes which are in between a line and a plane and have dimensions which are, for example, 1.4, 1.5, 1.7. Well, I would not like to emphasize uh, this dimension, idea of dimension because for many people it's mysterious and perhaps uh, overly mysterious. The main thing is that this is one of the basic technical tools of the study of these shapes. Now, let me proceed. In the case of fractals, instead of obtaining dimensions, which are again integers, you obtain fractions. So uh, on top, you, have, you replace the straight interval by the zigzag curve, and you get the snowflake curve in the bottom. You take this squarish zigzag curve, you obtain this other shape. You take this other shape, you obtain a space-filling curve. In general, you can manipulate shapes by these very simple recursive uh, mechanisms, which give you exactly linear re reductions and somewhat dull structures. But I said uh, the two variants of it I have no time for, self-affinity and, and multifractals, very important, but beyond the, the time I have at my disposal. I said before, if you want to get to really interesting structures, you must go beyond exact linear self-similarity to either randomness or to nonlinearity. And from now on, I'm going to study first the randomness and then the nonlinearity. First of all, randomness. On this um, uh, collection of pictures, each of them going from top to the right is a reduction of preceding one. That is a, a, pardon, a blow up. That is, you take a small, small piece which is marked by a white uh, uh, a square rectangle, I hope it's visible from where you sit, and you blow it up to see in greater detail. You add more detail, more detail, more detail. Now, the, the way you sit, at, you sit uh, the, because of the, the writing is small, I think the impression you must be getting is that there are nine pictures here which are more or less the same, about the same but very different in detail, but they are of the same kind. And that's the main point. The point is here that by having an element of randomness, of unpredictability, total unpredictability added to this construction of recursive adding of detail, one can obtain an amount of richness of structure which was totally beyond any expectation. In the same way as, again, in the case of music, by varying um, loudness or things, you get amount of detail which was well beyond expectation because nobody could believe that so much richness of sound could be obtained by simple rules. And uh, uh, the, um, the, in this case, of course, the mechanism was chosen in order to represent something about the shape of mountains. And uh, so uh, let us now uh, give a prelude uh, to the second thing. The transformation which I have studied most in the case of nonlinearity is one which goes from um, z to z squared plus c. It, why this one? Because it's simplest, you could write. More precise are two which are simplest. If you don't want to have something linear, you either take a square or take the inverse. And I've studied both. The one with a square turns out to be richer and more fun to work with than the other, which is why it became so widely popular. Now, the first person who thought of this uh, z squared plus c um, transform, uh, well, it must go back into very dim past. Uh, uh, in the 1870s, it was something which was not a new question in a certain sense. But um, certainly in 1904, a man named Fatou did a very great deal about it. Then, for many years, there was enormous interest in the study of it only on real axis, when you get from x to x squared plus c. And the work of Michel Feigenbaum is at the center of this investigation of the transform x going to x squared plus c. Well, what I did was to work on that in a complex plane, z, and I'll come back to it a bit later. Oh my goodness, the music is completely out of line, so I, I'm sorry I skip it because, well, 
there must be in a, a conference, especially in chaos, one element of randomness in slides. So you just saw it. <laughs> now we go, we go to, we go to, uh, to um, this imitation of, of, um, of mountains briefly to give credits, and then I'll proceed to something in physics, which is very, very amusing and unexpected. The, the thing which, the question which, in a certain sense, is center of, uh, of um, uh, what fractals are is the question of how long is the coast of well, I say Britain or Britain because it's very nice both in French and in English, the cost of anything. This question has been at the very core of the origins of geometry. That is, if one reads about the origin of geometry, that very much, of course, due to the Greeks, an extraordinary phenomenon that geometry was born in Greece and nowhere else, and uh, very much influenced by navigators who had gone west to explore Sicily and Sardinia and were very much at odds about how large the two islands were. Because on the one hand, it took less time to go around Sicily than around Sardinia, but it took less time to cross Sardinia on foot than to cross Sicily. So they're arguing very much, political, well, two parties, the party saying Sardinia is bigger, and the party saying Sicily is bigger. And eventually, the intellectuals came in and distinguished two things the area and the perimeter. So I say that what, is ha what happens is Sardinia is an island which is smaller but has much more complicated coastline. And uh, how they measure the coastline? Well, like any sensible Greek would do. They would just take a small boat and navigate, circumnavigate the island and see how long it takes to go around it. And they found indeed that in the case of Sardinia, the coastline is very long. In the case of Sicily, it was not very long. But if you come down to it, the whole thing was ridiculous. Because why a small boat? Why not a big boat? Imagine this, this, um, uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, area here. It's completely imaginary, but it's very much like a, a real uh, coastline. If you circumnavigate it with a big boat, avoiding the little islands because you may get um, aground, then you cover a small distance. A small, very flat boat would follow it very closely and get you longer distance. If you walk around the coastline, with seven league boots, you are going to get a, um, a short distance. You, if you look, walk on coastline with ordinary boots, you will get a, sh a, a longer distance. A mass will go into details where you have to, just two steps and an ant even longer detours. So if you come down to it, the idea of length, which seemed to be totally obvious, uh, solid, um, which every teacher of geometry had no doubts about, was in fact very, very soft. And then you go and see, in practice, did people make mistakes about length? They made terrible mistakes. For example, if you look at um, the Encyclopedia of Spain, Spain and Portugal, the length of the common border between the countries is described by Portugal as being 30% longer than what Spaniards say. That's the same line drawn on the, and people have been killed in I don't know how many wars to, to, to determine that the border is here and not here. And yet, the Portuguese say that 30% longer um, uh, border. Why so? Very simple. Portugal is a very small, much smaller country than Spain. Classrooms, um, uh, the maps where people measure the coastline are not the real terrain, but maps. Maps of the kind you have in schoolrooms. And in schoolrooms, Portugal gives maps which are much more detailed than Spain, because it's a smaller country. Therefore, details which are not visible on Spanish maps are visible on Portuguese maps. So you see, there is an element um, uh, which is very important of what the structure, the language you describe something with does to your description. By describing uh, frontiers by the language of Euclid, ordinary geometry, you hid this very fundamental fact. Now, let me uh, run very rapidly. This is a, a relief obtained by a very, very trivial thing, piling pyramids upon pyramids. The most childish model imaginable. A mountain is not a cone, but if you pile enough cones or pyramids on each, on each other, you get these very lifelike things. Now, these mountains, which you saw before, they are due to Richard Voss, again from St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, this one is a composite of um, uh, different things, again, due to Dick Voss. You saw it in the video. This is uh, something which is an imitation, if I can call it, uh, which was uh, produced in a science fiction film. 
There are some people who say that there's nothing else to fractal geometry except the fact that it leads to imitation science fiction films. Well, <laughs> that is meant to be put down. Uh, I think that actually it's very amazing that uh, something which was so sophisticated and so esoteric and so difficult before I uh, had a notion that might be a good way of describing mountains uh, turned in a few years from being that into being popular exercise. But something happened on the way. That is, to make these things faster and cheaper, they reduce the element of self-similarity, of self-aliveness that this shape has as compared to the preceding one. And you see all kinds of defects. You see kind of V in the bottom if there's enough light. You see a texture of crumpled paper, very, very visible. Here is a case in which something which was viewed initially as being purely an abstract mathematical idea, the idea of invariance being essential, that is a shape being run by its own invariances, if you weaken the invariances, if you let, let make them less, less powerful, then the shape becomes wrong. I had never expected myself that this would be so visible. And again, for those of you who know these references, there was a man named Felix Klein who, in 1870, had a program of science which was based upon the invariance in both mathematics and physics. These pictures here, which I've seen, are due to um, Ken Musgrave, who's a student of mine at Yale. It's part of his thesis. And this one, of course, competition between Ken and, and Dick. He wants to show that he can do Earth just as well, plus the clouds, which Dick didn't have. Uh, this one is a new development which is very interesting. Um, uh, James Bardeen, who is a physicist at the University of Washington, a cosmologist and relativist of great renown, uh, is also a computer nut. And um, he has his own Amiga computer. And uh, he read a paper of mine in which I expressed very great dismay uh, at the fact that all these previous mountains, however um, impressive they were from when seen from an angle rather low on the horizon, had something very wrong with them. We could have either mountains without rivers or rivers without mountains. But to put the two together, I had to do something very artificial. And so Bardeen um, came to think and reasoning very much like a physicist would, putting minimal amounts of further information about how the relief is formed, he got some pictures. I'm going to show to them with some apologies because they are done on a very small microcomputer. It's remarkable how good they are for, for it, but they're not the quality and finish of the others. So you obtain these effects that are not put in by hand. This relief was obtained by an algorithm which tells you a, well, a possible scenario for the formation of relief. Geologists, I know, are very impressed by this scenario because they think it may very well be the scenario that created the Earth relief. But if you want to, to test these scenarios, you must see what they actually give. And here the eye is our tool. Some scenarios, if tested by being implemented in pictures, vanish instantly. They may be very, 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 very promising a priori, but once you see them, they are just wrong. This scenario wins on the basis of being likely and of being very reasonable. This you have seen our clouds by Richard Voss. Some flowers by Prushinkevich, I have no time to explain them very much. And I go to a chapter on question physics. Well, um, this uh, cartoon appeared in American Scientist. Uh, we did the whole room over in fractals. Um, it is very misleading, and I put it here both because I was so amused and because I want to emphasize it. In this cartoon, the straight lines, like a table, and everything of, of how to say, human manufacturer has, be, has remained straight in Euclidean. It's only the decoration which is fractal. And the, the two are sort of separated. There's one and then the other. They don't mix. But in every investigation I've been uh, in, engaged in, they are, very, they are mixed in completely inextricable fashion. Well, let me give examples. Just to, to remind me the matter of distribution of matter in the, in the universe. This distribution is a fractal, a scale invariant, over a range which is a topic of great dispute. Some people say it's only five megaparsecs. Other people, it's a thousand megaparsecs. The great voids one discovers in, the, in between galaxies are a telltale sign of uh, fractals. They are obtained by fractals almost always, and to obtain without fractals requires an extraordinary amount of special assumptions. So quite possibly, this uh, model could represent distribution of galaxies of very long range. And I mention it here because it's as an introduction to the uh, kind of central issue as I see it, of the role of fractals in physics, more precisely statistical physics, but in physics in general. 
Uh, physics has been ruled by uh, some rules, which are called the partial differential equation of physics, the Laplace equation, the Fourier equation, Navier-Stokes equation, etc., etc. As the names indicate, they are roughly 200 years old. They arose roughly 100 years after Newton. They are, in many ways, a consequence of Newton, a development of Newton in 100 years. They have been very powerful, extraordinarily powerful, very surprisingly powerful in describing the structure of the world. They suppose a world in which everything proceeds in a very smooth fashion because they demand not only one derivative but two, and fractals typically have none. I have forgotten to mention, make this point, the fact that absence of the tangent, absence of length, goes with absence of tangent and uh, non-differentiability. So there is a conflict. How is the conflict uh, resol resolved? How is it that uh, the Laplace equation, or perhaps uh, the Newton equation, uh, or perhaps uh, Einstein's equation of gravitation, give rise to this distribution? In this case, uh, there is not much known. But in other cases, much, much more is known. This is just a passage um, to mention that there is something quite extraordinary about the surface of the Earth, that the fractures in the surface of the Earth have the same rules over extraordinarily broad range of scales, that um, the same rules follow for 100 kilometers over Nevada desert and over centimeters. But again, it's a challenge for geologists. Nothing is known. Now, I will st skip on that turbine because I have no time. I will skip on this because I have no time. But just to mention one thing, which is that in the case of diffusion of heat, which is a very important um, issue, um, uh, the, it is, uh, if you have uh, particles of uh, two colors um, uh, going to each other, let me try look the next thing. So here, in honor of the Swedish flag, it was done in, <laughs> in yellow and in blue. You have uh, yellow and blue particles diffusing into each other. What uh, um, the theory which I was taught, which everybody was taught, told us, was the thickness of a, um, a diffusion layer. At one end, it was all blue, at the other end, all yellow, and between, it was in between blue and yellow, and telling us what percent of blue and yellow. The question which one could ask oneself is, what is the shape of the bond between blue and yellow? This question arose um, from very practical investigations on soldering, as it turns out, has given rise to something quite extraordinary, the study of a foam which exists between blue and yellow, which shows that even in this particular problem, the, the, the two uh, aspects of, um, of uh, smoothness and of fractality coexist. But now I come to the most um, interesting one because most challenging because, of course, I'm working on it. It's a study st the, the, um, the, the structure of dust, the structure of aggregation. This here is a, is, a, is a photograph of a gold colloid. There are shapes which are little blobs of gold which stick together and which get, end up by creating shapes which are very complicated like that. The structure of these shapes is fundamental to understand the physics of colloids, what they do, and how they act. One must understand them. That structure is entirely fractal. And the fractal characteristics of it, dimensions of different aspects of it, determine the physics. I, w I still went very rapidly through another slide showing percolation, another field in which the whole of physics is determined by the geometry. The reduction of ge physics to geometry was a great dream of many physicists, and of course Einstein has done more than anybody else to realize it in his context of general relativity. But in this very different and very much modern, more modest context, the same thing is happening. All the physical properties are reduced to geometric properties, which in turn are reduced to the mechanism that create them. Now, how do you expect, explain this, um, this uh, structure before? Which, uh, you, there's a model called diffusion limit aggregation due to Sander and Witten, which I will not explain because I feel pressed by time. And this model, as, uh, in three dimensions, gives rise to these kind of shapes. Well, the reason I'm, I'm going to now um, stop on this thing because it exemplifies a, a question of, matter, of scientific method, which I think is important and which is close to my heart. The, the very brilliant physicists have uh, discovered this mechanism and have found a way of um, having particles come and get stuck together and color them by age. So the ones which came last are colored outside and the oldest are colored inside. And after this was done, after the fractal character of this shape was identified because one has seen those pictures and was then able to make some, some measurements, physicists came back to the natural behavior of physicists, tried to make a theory of it, tried to make measurements. 
Now, they didn't know what to measure, really, but that doesn't stop a determined person. Many measures were made. It was very difficult to interpret. Many were extremely important, others were dubious, and others one didn't know why, why bother measuring these things. The effort to make a theory had been very, very difficult and very unpromising. Now, why is it important to be bothered by theory? Well, because in this case, it turns out that in mathematical terms, the sh the, this shape is created by a Laplacian field. You have, a, you, you have an equation, which is, again, Laplace equation, you solve it, you obtain what is called the harmonic measure of Laplace equation. Many of you know it, others don't. Don't worry if you don't know it. I'm just explaining you a few lines what it, what it does. And in response to, that, to, the, to, the, to the harmonic measure, the boundary of the shape gets modified. So you see something completely new entered into uh, mathematical physics. Before, one solved the Laplace equation with fixed boundaries or with boundaries moving on their own separate will, pushed by a piston, for example. Here, one solves the Laplace equation in the environment where the boundaries are modified by the solution of the equation, plus an element of chance. So the equation itself changes boundaries. And that is the key to solution of the paradox of the coexistence of equations and of fractals. Equations are the smooth part. The uh, Laplace equation is valid outside of this very complicated branching structure. The branching structure itself is a boundary and it is fractal. That is, the fractals are not contradicted by partial differential equations, don't, don't contradict them, they are created by partial differential equations. Now, how, how does it happen? Well, to do so, we, a postdoc of mine named Carl Evers and myself, decided to look at these things closer. And so here is a, um, uh, here is a, a, a figuration of the different way of doing these, these, um, these clusters. They don't grow from one point out, they grow from a uh, bottom up. That's the way they were shown before. That's the way they were shown before. We uh, solved the equation and showed it and, um, and um, rendered it. Rendered it not for the purpose of decoration, but for the purpose of scientific research. To be able to, to understand what's happening, we want to see exactly what the potential was doing. We changed rendering constantly. Same people, same assistants who work on the um, students, assistants who work on the mountains and such things were working on this physics process. They changed the, 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 the rendering a little bit. We saw something. We changed again the rendering to see whether what we saw was real or not real. And this extraordinary, uh, complicated, and rewarding interaction of uh, several people with a machine, without machine, nothing will happen. Without people, nothing will happen. And different, different people react, interacting, we um, sort of hunted this potential uh, in its lair. And so uh, what we got was pictures of this sort. Now, this picture here, for reasons which I have no time to explain, and you are specialists, you wouldn't appreciate, uh, tells a great deal about potential. The fact that uh, well, the potential is, uh, the white regions are the, the low potentials. And um, it was believed low potentials are mostly in the bottom, but in fact, they are very much uh, up, in the, uh, up there. So here is a case where to study this shape of exquisite complication, we really had to understand what it is. All the theories which had told us it was in the bottom were just uh, based upon uh, intuition upon what's obvious, what's natural, but not about, fa about fact. In this world, we must learn, constantly modify our intuition of what is important or not. Well, um, then we had this rendering to, for, for different purposes. Uh, this was not a rendering of the potential when, when it was ever rendered. It never went into deep fjords. It was just to illustrate some ideas about potential. But we decided that, that potential was something deserved to be studied much more carefully. We turned the picture around. We didn't want to look at the world from the picture, from the dendrite viewpoint, but a dendrite from potential viewpoint. And for potential, this thing goes here. Well, let me uh, go briefly, because I would like simply to make, not to teach you a topic that is impossible, but to give you an outline of what's happening. One of my colleagues at Yale is Peter Jones, who is a great specialist of potential theory and had been teaching for several years a course of potential theory on fractals, which had emerged out of pure mathematics for its own, um, uh, in its own way. And he had theorems about uh, the behavior of potential. He had never realized what the theorems really meant because he had never seen them in action in a difficult shape. We had uh, not heard of 
John's theory because it was very esoteric. But being colleagues, we met, he saw our pictures, we started talking it over, and there is extraordinary meshing between the very abstract mathematics that Jones and Carlson and others are doing on this thing and the physics that we are doing. We are doing the same thing. The same thing can be called very pure mathematics if you go into mathematical details in the right. It, it is all, uh, done, called physics if you, tr if you sh search for reasons of the structure. Well, let me, uh, let me uh, now go into a different mode. The second part of my talk would have been chaos and fractals, but since Heinz Soto is going to, um, to present that, I will just go and show you some pictures very, very quickly in very few minutes. So um, this is a matter of Julia Setz, pictures, some comments. Now, Julia, uh, it's not Julia, it's Julia. It was my teacher of mathematics uh, when I was a student. And when I was 20, I was advised by many people, my uncle in particular, a very influential man in my life, a very great mathematician, to write a thesis on Julia Setz. I read that book of Julia and couldn't make heads or tails of it. So I told my uncle I will never, never want to do that and did something entirely different, but learned about Julia's theory. Now, Julia was a matter with a great deal of a geometric intuition, but absolutely no computers. And in fact, I don't know whether he would have even used computers had he had them because of his personality and the day and his time. But uh, we did, we started looking at com uh, computer genetic pictures of Julia's sets, discovered many facts about them which were absolutely obvious and very difficult to prove. And here I would like to make a point about mathematics, which is uh, very important. Uh, it's very important and also, I must say, it's controversial, because some mathematicians are very much of opposite direction, opposite opinion. I'm among those who think that in mathematics there are facts. The facts can be unproven and well described, they're called conjectures, they can be proven and they're called theorems. But the so-called four-color problem was a fact of mathematics for a very many long time before it was proven to be correct as a theorem. Um, many results about uh, soap bubbles were facts about minimal surfaces for 150 years before they were proven. By observation, one can very often get to facts. One can never prove anything by observing. So to, to, to achieve mathematical facts, one must take a drawing as a tool, the same way as primitive man, I'm sure, was drawing things on the beach or counting pebbles and obtaining facts about numbers and facts about elementary geometry before Euclid came to put the facts together. Facts have their own life, and they can be object, object to intuition. And by playing at length with um, the Julia set and sets related to it, we discovered many facts of mathematics of which some were proven instantly by the competent people, others are yet unproven, and others are proven more or less completely and have generated greater attention. So um, uh, these, are, these shapes here, which you saw in, 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 a, in the video, are by Alan Norton, who was a postdoc with me for a while. Uh, these are again Alan Norton's shapes, just for fun. The little, these, are, uh, these are cut through them, and this is a little man on top, and this. Uh, this is the set, this picture here, as I said, was by Voss. This is the Mandelbrot set magnified uh, 10 to 23 times. Um, in some corners of it, it's self-similar. Here is an example of a corner that's self-similar. In other corners, it is very far from self-similar. It's a shape which is uh, most conveniently called fractal, but it's at the very, very end of fractals. It's sort of at the very boundary of fractals. It's almost not a fractal, but uh, certainly very much part of the same theory. That's my favorite signature version of it. You saw these things that were obtained by modifying the definition of, of, um, of a Mandelbrot set by changing some signs, and I showed them just for their beauty. Um, and uh, this, again, would have been a work of art, I suppose, of embroidery of some sort, but it's, again, a mathematical formula rendered rather simply uh, by color code. This one has elements of uh, India, which is due to certain very peculiar um, mathematical properties which we put in the model, not to any effort to simulate Indian art. And uh, this, which looks like a piece of crystal, was uh, the effect of a computer bug. Uh, this one was a different computer bug. Uh, you recognize if, uh, in the shape, uh, outline of it, the outline Mandelbrot set, uh, as you should, because that's what it is. The rest uh, it was a result of uh, just very bad programming, which we preserved carefully. 
And this one again is what you saw before, except it's turned around. And so let me sum up. Uh, again, it's best to think of fractal geometry as being a geometric language. A language is being judged always by, not by itself, but uh, by the quality of the works uh, to which uh, it gives rise. And uh, uh, ordinary language is, is judged by quality of the poetry and the quality of the prose. Poetry would be a language used just for the pleasure without any usefulness. Uh, in this case, you have uh, already in its short lifetime two forms of poetry. One form of poetry which was uh, just purely visual that uh, uh, so many people would think that is art and uh, would be so um, involved in understanding why it is so, uh, why it looks like, uh, like, uh, like art rather than just uh, mathematical diagrams. And uh, it has great influence on many painters. In terms of prose, prose itself ranges from very utilitarian. Telephone directories are examples of prose. Railroad directory is examples of that also. In that sense, uh, fractal geometry has been extremely useful on a very lowly, everyday basis to engineers. Very often you, are, you deal with messes. Messes so complicated that even the most skilled people say, throw their hands up and say, I don't know how to describe it. I don't know how to, what to do with it. I don't know what to measure. I'm just lost. It's just a mess. It's just chaos. Chaos in the ordinary, everyday sense of the word. Very often, by being aware of the new, voc new vocabulary fractals, one knows what to measure and one can separate different chaoses, one can organize them, one can do what is uh, said, um, uh, some, called sometimes um, uh, just um, uh, natural history. Natural history is a very noble enterprise. It's not uh, the last word in science, but it's very important when you deal with very complicated messes. Now, what is the other kind of poetry? The other kind of poetry is mathematical poetry. Again, the fact that by using the eye, by using the computer to help the eye, by, we find that there, is, there are an enormous number of new facts of mathematics which we can discover. Those facts can be absolutely useless at the time. They can be very useful to physics, like the facts of uh, which we discovered about potential theory are. Uh, they vary, but uh, mathematics has its own standing. It doesn't have to be judged by usefulness because it is one of the great achievements of human mind. And last but not least, uh, I think, is uh, mathematical physics, which, is, uh, which I view as being kind of the great prose of science, which is, again, the great equations of, um, of science that you have listed, Laplace, Navier-Stokes, Fourier, the diffusion of heat, propagation of waves, the propagation of, uh, of, gravity, of potential, of pull, of, uh, of galaxies, of stars on each other, and so on. These equations have sat for 200 years and have had uh, enormous influence on, on our life. It is uh, remarkable that by focusing on the fractal aspects of the world, uh, somebody, one or another one of my friends, has been able to add to these equations new problems of uh, extraordinary unexpectedness, novelty, difficulty, and interest, and uh, to say one word, beauty. So, so we are in the situation of why it is that uh, these things are beautiful. E either beautiful because of the pictures are so much uh, attractive to us, beautiful or ugly, but reacting in a fashion which is emotional to mathematical shapes, whereas the ordinary reaction of most people to mathematical shapes is that of boredom or of uh, disgust or repellence. People like myself who lived, out, who lived in love of geometry, I realize uh, when I was a student, were in a very, very tiny minority. Um, so um, there is a very long discussion about it. Perhaps our, we have been uh, developed as a species living in a world which is full of fractals, the mountains, the trees, the clouds, and everything, of shapes of this form. Therefore, if you see these shapes in, in a different guise, in, in conditions where the self-similarity is less obvious than, for example, for clouds or for mountains, but is there anyhow, we recognize something familiar. And familiarity breeds, um, how to say, relaxation, 
And, uh, well, <laughs> that's one trivial explanation. Another much more ambitious would be that um, our whole perceptive system has been influenced by, by uh, this uh, um, environment and that uh, it has been organized to analyze these kind of shapes. Therefore, it loves to analyze new shapes of the same kind. And there is a great deal which can be said about perceptive system on this basis, which, of course, I have no time to discuss. As to mathematical beauty, it is something so elusive that I would hate to comment about it tonight. But uh, what I would like to end on is just a message of, of, uh, about the unity of, uh, of uh, uh, knowing and also feeling that the necessities of everyday science, uh, everyday work, uh, oblige us, scientists, to be different when, whether we do mathematics because we have fulfilled certain criteria or do physics different criteria, do chemistry different criteria. But in a certain sense, the division between these categories are not God-given, they are man-made, they are div divisions of convenience. In, uh, in this context, which uh, concerns a very simple, very crude, therefore a very fundamental um, invariance, namely self-similarity, we have elements of everything, of mathematics, of physics, of chemistry. And we have again this new element of aesthetic, aesthetics, which is certainly a very great surprise and a very rewarding one. So I just could only say, end by saying that I have found that to be a, a very strange adventure, to be drawn into that many years ago, and to have gone from one of these fields to another as uh, the chairman said, without ever feeling that I was changing my activities. And I hope that you have liked some of these pictures with me. Thank you very much.